This Marquee Dragon video is sponsored by Shattered Crystal, game codes and items. Our session is, uh, as you can see, it's building browser-based MMOGs. Uh, we're going to try to cover uh, pretty much anything related to massive multiplayer games uh, in the browser. So we're going to cover both you know, the technologies available as well as uh, you know, the type of problems that we've typically seen companies run into and how to address them and how to solve them. Uh, first thing we need to do is kind of get an idea for who's in the audience. Uh, there's few enough people here that we can kind of tailor this a bit. So uh, you know, who, which of you would consider yourself developers? All right, so good, we're mostly developers. Anybody considers themselves an architect? Yeah, this is way too real world, so you know, not, not a lot of ivory tower, but uh, uh, and we, I assume we've got, you know, the rest are, I don't know, probably coffee people. But uh, so anyways, uh, with that said, my name's Mike Grunvig and this is Job Maker. Uh, feel free to raise your hand if you have a question midstream, as long as uh, time's okay, we should be able to answer them then, but if we start running out of time, we might hold them to the end. We'll try to keep this, you know, moving pretty quickly. Sounds like we have a question already. They are, they're tracking down somebody. Uh, but if you can't hear, I'll, I'll try to. What's that? Oh, you need your email addresses? There you go. Yeah. Being, being the founders of the company gave us the good email addresses. Everybody else gets these huge ones. So uh, we've written actually uh, quite a few books on this. Still louder, all right. This is going to be really tough. So we've written quite a few books on uh, multiplayer games in the browser in general. Uh, and this is the latest book. Uh, Job was the predominant author on it. Uh, and this book shows how to you know, basically build a virtual world from scratch. And I'll let uh, Job speak to it. Oh, there we go. Oh, louder? <laughs> oh, OK, great. Um, yeah, so uh, uh, the book that I published last summer, uh, Action Script for Multiplayer Games in Virtual Worlds, is uh, I mean, the title is, speaks for itself, really. Uh, but it covers uh, multiplayer games in Flash and, uh, and virtual worlds in Flash. And uh, there's a lot of real-time multiplayer game techniques, um, smoothing, late latency hiding, uh, tile-based multiplayer games, turn-based, um, typical low-level, um, like fundamental features in uh, virtual worlds, like pathfinding, um, inventory, things like that. And so. Um, that's uh, I mean, that's what we do for a living, and you know, applied it to that book, and uh, some of that you'll you'll hear us talk about today in this in this session. All right, so the you know, <laughs> yeah, so the, the you know the big things we're going to cover are choosing client platform, um, development risk management, uh, kind of content management, in-game economy, uh, how do you develop customizable avatars, which actually proves to be more of a problem than most people realize initially, and finally, how do you minimize the cost per minigame, uh, as many virtual worlds, particularly on the web, are very minigame centric. Uh, we'll, we'll, you know, depending on interest, we'll go into as much detail as necessary on any of these. Okay, well, um, when you go to develop a virtual world or a social, large-scale social game on, on the web, you have a lot of client platform choices. Um, and I have a few of them listed here, um, the more uh, popular ones, uh, Flash, Unity, Java, HTML5, which has just recently become uh, <clears throat> talked about a lot. Yeah, for those Apple fanboys, it's uh, <laughs> you know, thanks to your man Jobs, but uh, for the rest of us, it's still far from a standard and not quite there yet. When, when I can actually play audio in the browser, without a plugin, then we can talk about it for games. But for now, we're going to kind of skip over HTML5. Right. And uh, <laughs> um, Mike might have a couple more choice things to say about it in a, in a few minutes. Uh, and uh, Adobe Shockwave Flare, which had its heyday a long time ago, it's still used a little bit, but um, not much. <clears throat> so um, in uh, this slide, we have a, a chart that just kind of shows you uh, plug-in penetration uh, or adoption rate of, of these various platforms. And uh, HTML5 isn't on this list because it's not a plug-in. And it's, is it just Google Chrome? It, it's, its adoption is non-existent. Yeah. And since I still can't play audio in the browser, I still can't make games with it. <laughs> I mean, I mean let, let, how do you make a game if I can't play audio? Do, do any of you have games with no audio at all that run in the web? That's I think there's a way you can play a WAV file. With, with Flash. So, so, in fact, many HTML5 games actually run a separate plugin just for the audio. Okay. And that seems wrong. <laughs> Not, and, and, of course, you can't run HTML5 in Firefox, for instance. 
25% uh, of the web or so uh, due to the H.264 codec being uh, closed source and licensed technology. So until somebody figures out a way around that, HTML5 and Firefox is going to be a long time coming. So you have a flash job on Shockwave, which has been around for years and years. Uh, and Unity, which looks like it's penetrating a very low percentage, but I mean, when, when did the um, Unity 3D come up with the browser? Well, it's, um, I, uh, I'm not sure exactly when, probably two or three years ago, but um, the amount of momentum that Unity has right now is, like, you can't even measure it. Like, if we had a little vector on all these. You're me, that's why I brought it up. Yeah. I'm just curious, like, what you project. I mean, if we're giving this presentation a year from now at this conference, Unity is probably going to be much higher yeah, of a bar. Oversight. Okay. Oh, it's it's much higher than that. I'm not sure where that uh, is. It's 40 to, 40 to 60 on the same thing. Many of the techniques that we'll cover in this actually do apply directly to Silverlight. In fact, we do have some slides that bring that up. We just don't happen to have it on the graph. Uh, now, where did the data for this come from? Market Watch or? Uh, I actually uh, I combed the internet and, <laughs> and pulled from different sites and clearly we're yeah. not statisticians. <laughs> this was more of just a visual representation, but but in general it, the market's pretty clear. There's a handful of technologies that are clearly more popular, and then there are up and coming technologies, and the choice is going to come down to features and the like, and we'll, we'll talk about that in a sec. <clears throat> oh well, I guess the the main takeaway from this this graph is uh, you know everybody has flash. Um, and then less than half the people have the other stuff. Uh, and on this slide, uh, this is more of like a, uh, an, an overview of, if, if you're looking to develop a virtual world in, uh, in one of these various platforms, uh, here's some, some things that can help guide, guide your choice a little bit. Um, you know, this, some of the uh, languages have a little bit more of a learning curve, or maybe they're a little bit more limited from a performance standpoint. Or you know maybe you really need real time 3D and so you know Flash isn't isn't an option. Um, so this is this uh, slide we just put together to uh, kind of give you it's, it doesn't point in one one specific direction. It just kind of gives you uh, a, a way to survey each of these individually and, and see the, the pluses and minuses. Now one one thing that's tricky about this and and, and I apologize we don't have tons more graphs. So you, you didn't step into the wrong business section. I mean, we'll, we're done with the graphs after this one, I think. But uh, uh, one thing that was tough to quantify was Unity 3D. You know, it's typically anybody building a large Unity project using C Sharp, I assume. Uh, I don't know who in their right mind would build a huge Unity project in JavaScript, for instance. So they're probably using C Sharp. Uh, and C Sharp as a language itself is relatively easy to learn. We'd call it moderate language. Um, and if you already know Java, C Sharp is easy and vice versa. Uh, but Unity itself has a lot of its own paradigms that you have to learn. And that's probably the last time I'll use that word, too. I just slipped out. But uh, uh, so the big thing is you have to learn a lot of event handling that's unique to Unity. And it has a lot of weird issues that it's young. It has issues like if you don't capture an event, you can crash the browser. There's a lot of fun little ones like that that you have to be very careful with. Again, good coding will get around those. But so for a learning curve, we just kind of we put it medium, uh, and we put Java medium as well. But likewise, with Java, you're going to end up using something like uh, JMonkey 3D or OGNL or, or, or I'm sorry, OpenGL or any of these various 3D platforms. All of those have their own learning curve, so it's difficult to quantify. The, the real answer is that Flash is significantly easier to learn, but a lot quirkier, and there's a smaller developer base. But it's also slower, and it has the penetration. I mean, it's it's you know this whole decision is a wash in trade-offs, and the trade-offs are unfortunately critical. And the decision you make for your technology really drives what features you're ultimately going to be able to have. You know, there's many things you can do in Flash, and there are many things you can do in Unity. And the overlap is not as great as you'd think. You know, true 3D in Flash, we would say, just is not viable. Uh, many companies will disagree with us, and I challenge any of them to get good performance with a realistic number of avatars. The, the caveat is always, well, we've got three avatars on the screen at once, and they look great. Yeah, they're about 1,000 polygons. Right. You know, who, who in your right? Well, we have some 3D app developers in here. People have done traditional 3D. Yeah, we've got a good number. So, so you know what I mean. 1,000 polygons, I mean, this is like Quake 1. Barely. You know, I got more gibs when I shoot somebody with a rocket launcher. So, you know, you really have to work around that. And you can do a good job. Good artists can make that work, but it's very difficult. So if you want true 3D, we would say Flash is not your choice right now. Is that going to get better? Sure. Computers get faster. Everything gets faster. But is it really good now? No. And if you're planning on your future project, I mean, how much money are you willing to sink into the hope that an open source 3D project is going to make Flash perform better? 
I mean, that's a tremendous risk. On top of that, the, the tool chain and pipeline for Flash 3D is quite poor. So as opposed to Unity, which has a absolutely superb 3D pipeline, the workflow in Unity is top notch. In fact, that's, that's why we feel Unity is gaining so much traction. So while Unity has small penetration, if you need 3D in the browser, Unity is an excellent choice, assuming you're willing to accept the fact that many of your users are going to have to download a plugin. Plugins relatively small, seems to work pretty well, but that's the, that's really your trade-off. Great, you know, great 3D, very high quality, in fact, uh, excellent programming language in C sharp, but not a lot of penetration on that plugin. That might change. If you want to be an early adopter, you can pick it now, or you can play it easy. And in two years, we expect that penetration will be much higher. Well, one other nice thing about Unity is that they have the. Uh I think it's the lowest bounce rate for plugin installs. So when someone's prompted to have it installed, it, it goes smoothly and the people don't leave. You know, the, if they're going to start in, installing it, they usually finish and uh, and, it, and it works. Whereas a, uh, I think with Shockwave, you might even have to restart the computer. <laughs> you know. So um, anyway, all this leads to. Uh, oh, was there a question? Scratching or got a question? <laughs> Not a question. All right. <laughs> um, yeah. So all, all this really leads to uh, that if, if you're going to build a an MMO or large scale uh, social game br browser base today, you're pretty much going to use Flash or Unity. Or and, and when we say Flash, Silverlight would be a potential in there as well. Uh, it just doesn't have the the current popularity of Unity of Flash, which is why we <coughs> predominantly are calling it Flash. But most of these slides that talk about Flash specific techniques apply directly to Silverlight. Um, so uh, uh, these are things you probably most uh, most of you already know about Flash, but the player ubiquity, it's everywhere. Um, it's a huge plus for it. Uh, there's tons of developers that already know how to program ActionScript or have familiarity with Flash IDE. You can build things quickly. Uh, you know, you, you can build a game in weeks and, and get it online. And uh, it's kind of multi-platform. Uh, and Unity has some uh, some great uh, pros also. Um, it performs really well, for, especially for a, a plugin that as small as it is, it, it performs amazing. And uh, you can achieve these amazing, um, really rich exper uh, 3D experiences. Uh, I've, I've I'm always impressed uh, when I see some of the Unity games out there. It's just I can't believe it's, it's the browser. If you haven't seen the the Unity shooter demo, uh, that's well worth seeing. Uh, and also, they've got a little island demo that's yeah. well worth seeing. Both of those look very good. They're not, I mean, you're not talking, uh, you know, Far Cry or anything like that, but they are excellent. And when you consider that they're done in the browser and the tool chain isn't something as horrendous as, like, say, Unreal, uh, you realize that this is actually really impressive. Then you add into the fact that Unity runs on every platform under the sun or, or is planned to run on them. I mean, iPhone, uh, the Wii, they're working on uh, ports for uh, the major consoles, Android. Then it's all the major browsers. I mean, it's it's a pretty compelling argument. Uh, it always comes down to the risk, though. Plug-in penetration's not there yet, and assets in 3D are significantly larger than streamed 2D assets that you'd use with Flash. So the gameplay experience is different too. But Unity has access to the file system, so you can cache locally. Something you can't do in Flash. Flash-based browser-based game, you download everything every single time, and that can't be downplayed. The amount of bandwidth your game takes is the exact same for every single player for the initial load. So if you've got a 20 meg intro video that everybody has to watch while you're doing something, that 20 meg video is for every single player every time. And if your UI takes three megs, let's say it's, it's a lightweight UI, three megs is nothing for a UI that looks pretty good, got a good bit of graphics, inventory, things like that. Well, that three megs, you've got, say, 100,000 players, they play once a month. Well, it's 100,000 times three megs. And bandwidth is cheap, but it isn't free. And it gets very expensive very quickly. So that is something to consider. Whereas with Unity, it is possible to uh, stream that down once, save it locally. And then the next time it runs, do a check against the local version with the remote version, am I up to date, load it. Um, games like Fusion Fall, for instance, use a trick like that extensively. So I, I'm not going to touch that one publicly. <laughs> the only thing I'll say is that it's, there's a big fight, 
and how it's going to play out is anybody's guess as of right now. But there's obviously, you know, potential, and that's a, always a concern. So that that's just something to take into account. I have not heard. I, I can only speak to. I've not heard of any friction for other platforms with Unity. Um, most companies seem happy that if Unity wants to support them. That's kind of a, a boon. Um, you know, the the iStore is kind of an exception to this. Uh, in private, we can talk about this more. But in the public forum, we we're not going to prognosticate much, <laughs> and we're going to try to stay out of game design as well. So we're we're focusing more on the concretes. But obviously, Adobe Apple's fight is something to watch for, and that's why we don't say the Flash officially supports. Uh, the iPhone, even right. though they do have a way to do it, because obviously that fight's going to affect that. The, the last presentation I gave was about a month ago, or plus or minus a week, <clears throat> and uh, somebody asked a similar question. Uh, the, the presentation was heavily Flash-centric, and uh, someone asked about Flash on the iPhone, because I, I, I showed a game that we created in Flash for the iPhone, and they asked, uh, a, you know, will Apple step in the way of that and, you know, squash Adobe's hopes of, of being able to continue to release Flash apps on the iPhone. And uh, I said, no, <laughs> no, there, there's no way. Like, uh, Adobe found a way to play by the rules. You know, they, they created the, uh, the, com the converter cross compiler that uh, allows uh, Flash apps to be run and, uh, and not break the terms of, of service at all. So I was like, no, there's nothing Apple can do. That same day, <laughs> later that day, is when the Daring Fireball blog article came out. And, you know, I got a couple of emails from people that were in that session. You know, <laughs> it's just kind of like, I mean, there's, it's, it's hard to predict the future. And, you know, we, we could right now, and, and by 5 p.m. today, Jobs could have a, you know, a, a new terms of service, perhaps. Yeah. <laughs> anyway. Um, Flash, as long as it's been around, still has problems with stability every once in a while. How is you? Well, I, well, first of all, I'll, I'll actually comment on the Flash stability. Uh, bad code is bad stability. Flash itself is pretty good. Uh, there are some gotchas that uh, we won't have time to cover here, but if somebody is looking at spinning up a major Flash project, lots of memory usage and the like, Job's a real expert, and uh, we're at, we'll be in the lobby at our booth for the rest of the show, and so we could easily enumerate some of the very specific issues that can cause Flash crashing. Uh, as for Unity, I don't, unfortunately, we don't have any of our Unity guys here. So I don't know that we can give a hard answer to stability in general. Uh, we do have several Unity people, though, that if you want to go offline, we can have them you know, give an opinion on, on it specifically. OK. Well, um, uh, the last point here is that Unity has a lot of momentum. We, we touched on that a few minutes ago. And uh, so I, th I think you're going to see tons and tons more games and virtual worlds uh, that are using Unity. And it's just going to keep growing. So you know the, the end result being, it's a tough choice and it's a critical one, and obviously you have to decide right up front, uh, and it's, and your features will ultimately in part be driven by the technology that you choose. So you know I'd love to say you can pick either of them and it's ubiquitous, but it really isn't. And there are certain things you simply can't reasonably do in one or the other, and uh, you know every developer's like, oh, I guarantee I can make it work. You probably could, but the amount of effort involved would break the budget or simply not be worth it. The end result might not be as good simply because you're trying to work around a limitation. So it's better to you know, understand the limitations and make an educated decision as to what makes sense for your project. And it might not be what you think. Uh, you know, we, there are many cases where we found Flash is more than acceptable. You know, how often do you really need true 3D? Many games, isometric's good enough. Uh, and, and isometric's very approachable and also runs great in Flash or Silverlight or any of the rest. But if you really need 3D, Flash isn't a choice so much. So uh, the next thing we're going to talk about, uh, and this is, this is more lecture than not, so this will actually go pretty fast, but we're going to talk about development risk. Uh, first off, every developer overestimates their capability and underestimates the time it takes to build something, myself included. Um, we also badly underestimate the complexity. We overestimate our understanding of the requirements. And the business overestimates their description of the requirements and underestimates what they're really going to need. So none of us get it right. Uh, in fact, the last stat I heard was something like, what, 80% of all IT projects go over budget? Uh, I think 80% was that the number I think it was? Gartner's got this. They republish this every year. And it, the short answer is IT is terrible. We were really bad at this. And game developers would like to say we're not IT, but we are absolutely IT. We just happen to build funner things than insurance apps. 
uh, but it's basically the same thing. And good techniques that are used in IT and the corporate world definitely apply to the game world. There's a lot of resistance to this because we see ourselves as not corporate developers. But the fact is, corporations are pretty good at trying to squeeze efficiency and we can really leverage a lot of those. So the big things you have to do is reduce the risk. Right, games fail, and, and the game industry really takes an honest look at itself. Games fail all the time. And it's usually due to a variety of things like, well, they're gonna, everyone's gonna say not enough money, but I'll be a little bit more blunt and say, trying to overreach. You know, if you have X amount of money, you should be able to plan for that and attempt to develop to that amount of money. You know, you should not have to go back to the, you know, back to the well for more. And so a lot of this can be handled with good risk mitigation in your development practices themselves reducing your, you know, how long it's going to take you to build it, but also reducing how many bugs you're going to have to fix and streamlining your, your process, which we found is a huge savings. So the first thing you have to do is kind of architect your project knowing that these things come up. And th this is where, you know, the architect actually, you're like the hero of the team at this point, as long as it actually works. You know, if it fails, they'll blame you for that too. Um, but you need to, you need to plan for a good number of developers. And, and this is much harder than it sounds, and ultimately it's a moving target. Many games build this monolithic game system where it's very hard to modularize the, the code. And that's because it's easier to build some huge cohesive app. But when you talk about adding more developers, like it's crunch time and we're gonna miss our date, can I add three more people to the project? Well, the short answer is usually no. I mean, how often have we told that to the managers? No, can't do it, there's no place to put them. Of course, usually we phrase it something like, it would take longer to train them, but the real answer is the code base is so complex, there's no place for them to jump in efficiently. If we had architected the application so that it was modular, so the components are standalone and plug in with known interfaces and design, then it would be much easier. We wouldn't need to teach them the whole app. We would only teach them this little piece. You know, good APIs help immensely with this. Uh, you know, a lot of techniques like dependency injection and good object orientation. All of these help immensely. And when you're talking these web-based tools, uh, things like AS3 and C Sharp are both fully object oriented. So you should be taking advantage of everything that brings. Uh, you know, design it so your modules can be loaded in and unloaded at runtime allows you to test modules individually. So you really need to be able to expand the number of developers quickly uh, to be able to be a, you know, reactionary to changes in scope. Because when the business people realize that the game they've designed is no fun, you know, that's a big deal. And if the answer is it's gonna take us six months to scrap and restart, you've done something wrong. You know, realistically, you should be able to adapt very quickly, and, and it's tough. And I'd love to say we always get it right ourselves, but we don't, and you never will. You just have to be as flexible as possible. Uh, likewise, you need to architect the system to support scaling the number of assets. So, you know, God forbid it's a successful application, nobody plans on the number of assets they need. In fact, everybody does this little trick. We're only gonna build it for a minimum launch. What's the minimum necessary? Of course, quickly you realize that your competitors built the minimum necessary, and their minimum necessary is quite a bit more minimum, quite a bit less minimum than yours, and now you're not actually even competing at the time, so you need to expand the number of assets immediately. Well, that's, again, seems easy, but it can be a real problem, and we'll cover this one a bit more later, but you really need to plan on the ability to scale up your asset pipeline and to scale up how you get assets into the game. Uh, we'll cover this a lot under the content management section. Uh, and finally, you need to architect the system to actually support the players you think you're gonna need. Uh, and of course, everybody, we hear this all the time. I need to support 200,000 concurrent players. So let's say you're building the next Facebook game. The rule of thumb is 100 to one. That's a real important number, 100 to one. You get about 100 uh, registered users who play once a month per every one concurrent user. Uh, in an MMORPG, the number's closer to 10 to one. You get 10 registered users to every one concurrent user. So if you say I have, I have 100,000 concurrent user requirement, I mean, how many registered players are you really talking about? Somewhere between lots and holy crap, we're the next blizzard. And so real, be, be realistic. But at the same time, many companies will throw that 100,000 number out there and then support 10,000. And obviously that's not right either. So what you have to do is you have to architect the system to be scalable, to be extensible. Uh, and to actually handle the load, but don't go off the deep end. We've seen companies absolutely blow their budget on hardware. I'm sure you guys have seen that too. You know, the system is architected okay, and the answer is we'll scale with hardware. And, and hardware is cheap-ish, but it gets very expensive very fast. And particularly when you bring an admin in who's going to look at it and say, well, for every 0.9% of scalability, I uh, double the cost. 
And that's the rule of thumb, usually. So 99.9 .9 reliability is twice the cost of 99% reliability. And add that another 0.9, doubles again, uh, easily. In fact, it actually can go quite a bit higher than that. So you do have to keep this into account. Your software should scale a lot. You should, it should be stable. You should be able to absolutely beat it to death in load tests well before the app hits production. In fact, while it's early development, your infrastructure should be reliable and dependable. There's no way these days you can get away with launching an application that crashes at launch. MMOs have failed and crashed and burned for this for years. And many companies that have successful launches, they win this race because of it. Uh, World of Warcraft's launch, as an example, was excellent. By comparison, for the number of users, it was remarkably good. Uh, Anarchy Online's launch, though, if you guys remember years ago, was an abysmal failure, which is too bad, because the game actually did very well uh, review-wise, but their launch for a good month was unplayable. And unfortunately, that, you know, that really hurt their product, and it took years to even attempt to overcome that. So unfortunately, you, can't you have to support that scaling right up front. So then we talk to the actual code. Let's say you've architected it beautifully. You've got a pretty good system down. Now you need to actually flesh out your game features. Uh, one thing we've seen very commonly is a manual build and deploy process. If you have you know, a 10-person team and one of those people has to be assigned to your build and deploy, you've done something wrong. I'll say it flat out. You've got something wrong. You should not have to assign a team that small to have a dedicated build person. This is common practice in the game industry, and it's because there's not enough automation being used. You're compiling code. I mean, how many people need to be involved to run the compiler? You should be able to script that. And so we suggest using tools like Ant or Maven. The, while those are Java tools, they're not limited to Java. Ant can compile pretty much anything. If it can execute via command line for compilation, Ant can run it. And you can script this whole process. Deployment's a big piece of this, too. Half the time, somebody runs the build on one machine. I mean, how many of you guys have like a build server that's only used for builds and it's like on someone's desktop? Do we have anybody that bad? No, no one's doing the desktop build. Good. That was, you know, four or five years ago, that was pretty common. One person was the build guy. And it only worked off his machine. You know, you know, heaven forbid I built the game and there were bugs everywhere. He builds the exact same game and it works. Well, this is a situation you desperately have to avoid. And it's horribly expensive to get into this scenario because you can't spin up new people. Everybody should be able to build the app like that, consistently and reliably. When I want to test the app as a developer, I should be able to test the whole app without waiting for a nightly build to kick off. There should be some way to test my components. This is all a matter of efficiency. Uh, so we'd also say deployment is a big piece of this. Uh, we're huge fans of continuous integration in general. Uh, in fact, we've gotten in the habit of all of our current projects and all of our clients' projects where we consult with them we basically insist upon them setting it up so that a single app can be built, deployed, website content, database content, game server content, the actual uh, game assets on the web servers, all of that should be deployable at a push of a button and shouldn't take more than 10, 15 minutes for the system to do it. And that's totally achievable. Now we don't have time to get into the exact hows of we do that, but if you guys are curious, we can tell you the tools that we use to do it. Uh, we're not using anything special. We're using off-the-shelf tools, and that's actually a big recommendation of ours. Off-the-shelf tools everywhere, if you can get away with it. If you have to customize it extensively, once again, something's wrong. If it requires extensive rework to use this tool, your process is probably wrong. I mean, to be totally honest, if you have to customize everything, maybe you should rethink why you're customizing it and instead focus on the efficiencies that a tool off-the-shelf will buy you. You know, is it really necessary to have a hand-tooled deployment every time? And the answer is no, it shouldn't be. You know, you, you don't think sites like Microsoft.com, which runs on something like a thousand web servers, you think they hand deploy that? Of course not. But game companies will routinely find it acceptable to hand deploy huge apps. And it's because they've never had to, it, it, it's just built into the process. The assumption is the game starts small, we hand deploy it. Well, if you right up front auto deploy it, and when the process becomes big, it's still auto deploys. You know, you, those efficiencies save you. Every time I compile that code, this automation saves me time, saves me money. And it's, this is a hard number in the end, and it's a significant number. Giving any of your developers the ability to build and deploy the application and test it, their machine or on any number of dev servers using something like EC2, which we found works beautifully, particularly for keeping costs down, this saves massive amounts of money over the life of the project. You know, an 18-month project, if I save five minutes a day per developer. That becomes days and days and weeks even at the end of the project, particularly as bigger development teams. So we think that's pretty critical. And right in line with that's automated test cases. Your back-end infrastructure should test itself. Now, I, we, we fully recognize you have to have QA. 
we're not at all suggesting against that. But your code base might, let's have say, 100,000 lines of code, of which much of that code is going to be boilerplate. It's just the nature of the beast. You're going to have a lot of code that does some basic things over and over again. Your network layer in particular is going to have tons of basic network handling. It's always the same. There is no reason that an automated test case running as part of your build process can't execute that code. And then using, depending on the language you're using, you can get much more sophisticated, but both .NET and Java support this nicely. Then you can do things like evaluating what code was executed. And this is, this is considered typical good software engineering practice at big companies, but it's kind of new to the game industry. So you should be able to actually get a report kicked out of your code that says, here's the lines of code that were run, here's the lines that weren't. Of all of my if statements, 38% have been tested by this automated case. You, the more you can automate those testing and getting hard results back, the more confident you're going to be that, of your code working, and the less you're going to have those 11th hour, you know, the app broke, we don't know why, somebody's debugging the network layer. By the time you get anywhere near launch, all of that should be perfect. You should be totally pleased with it. That doesn't mean bugs aren't going to creep in, they always will. But this means that you're, you're, I made a little tweak over here and the ripple effect broke six components over here. That type of thing will get caught as soon as I commit that code because those basic test cases will run much of that code. You, you'd be surprised how much code gets tested with a few simple automated tests. And we would strongly recommend that those tests are tied right into your build process. When I commit code, it should compile it for me. You know, I mean, don't get me wrong, I, I trust developers to compile their code, but let's, let's be honest, how many of them consider compiling a test? None of you will admit it, but we all do it. Every one of us compiles, they're like, oh, compiled, must be good. It's only an if statement, it couldn't have broken anything. Yeah, it could, it could broke everything. You know, minor changes can ripple through these apps, and the more complex the app gets, the faster this happens. And this is a fact of life, and we usually deal with it with lots of QA overhead. Well, QA is expensive. Automated test cases are cheap, and they will speed up development, but it means you have to commit to it up front. Uh, and finally, back to what I said before, you know, there's many companies that offer technology like us, you know, in fact, you should just license everything we have and all this is done. But uh, many companies license technology to help with this. In many cases, that's much cheaper than doing it yourself. And many of these companies specialize. Um, for instance, we like Atlassian's tool suite for managing builds and deployments. We use a lot of open source stuff too. Could we invent Maven or Ant using Make? Oh, you bet. You know, somebody wants to spend the next six months building Super Make, which how many companies have done that? I mean, how many companies have customized Make to the nth degree to get around this? And, it's, and then you now have the Make guy, right? We need to modify the Make script, and nobody knows how to do it except for the Make guy. I see a lot of head nodding. I'm, this is very traditional, and it's very typical, and it's, it's happened in, in non-game systems, too. It's just you have to get away from this mentality. Automation, automatic testing, automatic deployment, all of these things have a massive effect on your bottom line, and these are... Things that we always ignore until the last minute. Nobody thinks about automating the build until they realize the build takes three hours and ties up one of your critical developers for those three hours. Or adding a new asset requires a redeploy of the whole system as opposed to a partial deploy. Things like that. People don't even think of this until it's already a problem. And by then, the cost to fix it is very measurable. And it really should be addressed up front. So we've certainly harped on that enough. The Going from here, the... Uh, is into content management. Uh, and, and content management is a, it's, it seems so simple, but content management is kind of a, uh, kind of a, a one end problem, right? So if it takes you 10 minutes to make a shirt for your game, which realistically is gonna take way more than that, but let's say it's 10 minutes. I need to make 100 shirts for launch, but well, you know, 100 times 10. Well, if I could make it take eight minutes, that two minutes is a hard savings and gives me more content, faster, cheaper. Uh, if I can make it so it takes eight minutes and doesn't take a developer, that's a huge savings. Because to be honest, we're kind of expensive. And content people generally aren't that expensive. So in the big picture of things, the less I have developers doing content jobs, uh, the, the cheaper my project's going to be. And, and, and it all comes down to money. If I have more money, I can overcome a lot of ills, right? So if there's money to burn, I can get away with a lot of things I couldn't do otherwise. More features. Then you could, you know, try some new technology that you're a little risky, but you know, if you've got everything else in line, you've got time to do it. So, you know, content management, you can't look at it in the short term. You have to look at it in the long term. You have to assume your project's going to be successful and then back into how long is it, how much is it going to cost me to maintain this. If you build an MMOG, the game is not yours once it launched. It becomes your customers. And they demand more content. In fact, they're the worst taskmasters out there. You know, your power levelers are going to burn through everything you've got in, you know, a week. 
they'll find some exploit and it'll be done in three days. Uh, or, you, or say you build like the next Farmville. Once again, people will burn through that content quickly and they're gonna want more. Well, that's a finite cost per item that's going to continue indefinitely, as long as your project's running. So any savings both saves now and as well as your long-term projections. So you really have to consider the big picture on content. And, and one of the biggest things we found for reducing the cost is streamlining your workflow. Reducing how much it costs per piece of content by simply making it faster to make content. Uh, an anecdote uh, for this of something we ran into, uh, a lot of Flash games require Flash assets, which makes sense, right? Flash, Flash. But Flash has the ability to load raw assets too, like pings and things, and you can use them right in the game. Well, many game engines require pings to be made into Swifts, which is Flash's asset format, that, that you then pull into the game. Well, that's okay, except for your artists generally aren't drawing things in Flash. They're drawing them in Photoshop or Illustrator or making 3D models they render. So they draw it, then they know Flash to pull it in to create a Swift file that they then upload somehow into the system that a programmer then incorporates. Nobody estimates that whole workflow. Everybody estimates little pieces, and their estimates are always low because they don't estimate the big picture. Well, if you could, for instance, stop using Flash so that your artists don't have to know Flash, don't have to have it installed at $700 a seat, I think, 700, 600? Something like that. Yeah, it's, it's you know, not trivial. Don't have to have it installed, don't have to know how to use it, and don't have to create it. Now they're just using Photoshop out, 3D out, Illustrator out to a ping, and then you use a tool that means your developers don't have to actually upload the asset. It can be referenced, like, say, via the database you've cut a huge amount of time to that workflow. Once again, your developers are no longer in the content pipeline. They're now developing code. And let's be honest, which of you likes uploading the assets for a game? Yeah, see, they're getting no hands on this one. Nobody like, no developer likes doing anything but code or slacking, which I think everybody likes. So, but no developer likes doing the, the content stuff. You know, and, 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 you know, how many times have you gotten like a big spreadsheet? Here's the 30 assets you need to get it incorporated. Well, all that should be as automatic as possible, and tools and workflow will do that. Um, and that's ultimately the answer to the next question. How do you free up the developers? Get it so the people that make the content incorporate the content. Uh, and we'll show some tricks on that on the next screens. Uh, and a lot of that's you need to ensure that the standards are used, uh, getting away from custom everything. So if, for instance, you can use pings, well, many tools can create pings or JPEGs. And there's many libraries that can create pings or JPEGs. So let's say for whatever reason you have to have a ping or JPEG in there and you're using a 3D program. Well, they can export ping or JPEG. That's really convenient. That's a standard that's easy to support. Let's say you're using Swifts. Is Swift a standard? Well, Adobe would say yes. I would say not really. And are there tools to build Swifts? Not so much, kind of. You know, the Flash editor and a few others. Can you make an asset? Not easily. You can end up scripting Flash, which is kind of a hassle. So if you end up using these proprietary technologies, that can often burn you, because now your workflow is contingent upon finding some way to speed it up using something specific like that. And I'm picking on Flash here, but there's many other worse examples of, of like 3D model formats that might be supported that are an obscure format. You, know, you really need to be able to use the most common formats. You need to be able to have code that can talk to those formats. Otherwise, you can't automate it. Right? You don't, and you certainly, and this is so common, you certainly don't want to have to estimate the time it takes to teach someone a new proprietary format to develop a tool to re-export that format in another format, which is common practice in 3D games. I, mean, how many, you know, I know people in here have worked on exporters or importers, and it's a common practice, but that's horrible. Why am I teaching one of my very expensive developers who wants to build the game how to deal with a 3D model in a format that I don't like because I need to re-import it to something else to re-export it. Or I'm building Maya plugins to export the model in this other format. I mean, these are all things you want to avoid. These are inefficiencies that are expensive and they're considered the norm, but they really shouldn't be. You know, the open standards, open formats, and I, it doesn't mean open source. It could just be a publicly accepted format that's used everywhere. That's fine too. Uh, we like open source, but it doesn't have to be limited to that. You just need to get away from the very proprietary, hard to interoperate with, things like that. Get into something that's a bit easier to work with. Uh, and so finally, you, you start talking specific tools, and these are ones that we found are most expensive uh, and most valuable in use. So asset creation, like we said, just the process of creating assets, get it as close to as possible to like, say if you're talking art assets, get it as close to your artist tools as possible. Um, and it doesn't mean you can't script everything, but try to avoid expensive process. So, uh, and I don't have a copy of it here, we'd show it, but for instance, we found a lot of inefficiencies in creating those Swift assets, and that's what we used to require for our own tools. And we, we really didn't like it, and so we came up with a tool that you run, and you drag the images into it. 
And it, what it does is it bundles them up in the format that the system needs because straight pings is inefficient for the system. So what it did, you drag and drop, and it gave you some nice little WYSIWYG, here's what you're uploading, and then you just hit save. So the very much artist friendly, they worked right off their desktop. All the assets actually got pushed to a remote server, so everybody's dealing with the same content simultaneously. No Excel file getting passed around, everything's put right into the database. That's a good example of a workflow that sped things up immensely. Huge savings in time. Uh, the actual cost to make the tool, week and a half, I think, two weeks, all told. So two weeks of one developer and I don't know how many hundreds and hundreds of hours of savings over the life of the project. And I got the developers back on code, not doing you know, asset integration. Item management's another big one. Your game's gonna have tons of items. You need to manage those items. It needs to be quick, needs to be easy. Um, vendor management's part of that too. So like say you're building an MMO, with vendors, pretty common concept, very out there all, the, all over the place. Well, you're gonna need to set pricing. Well, this is the type of thing that your content people are gonna to wanna to customize all the time. And once you go live, these tools get even more valuable because now you officially support, you know, updating your content production, which is pretty cool. You know, you don't want your coders to have to be out there. You want your content people to actually be able to go out there and like, obviously this is too cheap because everybody's got one. So it's a combination of overpowered and too cheap. Well, they should be able to tweak that. It should not require a recompile of your code to modify those type of things. That's an inflexibility that's going to cost you money. You know, if, if you require code for every item, your design is wrong, your architecture is wrong. If, if everything has custom code, that's inefficient and that will cost money. Uh, Localization is another one, uh, as is questing. These are things we found take a long time to create and add. Tools for these help. Localization is particularly tricky. Uh, is people here work on localized projects usually? Yeah, I get a fair number of head nods. Well, if you've done any significant localization, it's a nightmare. You have to account for it up front, but you never account for it enough. And the actual process is horrendous because you'll end up dealing with multiple different people for different languages, and there's a workflow to it. And you're gonna have problems like the field length is too short for this language and too long for this language, and so it's just, it's a real hassle. Well, a tool for that can help tremendously and is one that we'd really recommend. Now we were going to show this, but I think we're running a little too tight on time to do it. I think we should show it. All right, so, so, so Job says show it. So all we're going to show is just a quick flash map editor that we use. Uh, and I show this as an example of a, a way to just visually see how a workflow could be sped up. So we had to create, we, we, we end up creating a lot of these isometric maps. Uh, and so this is the editor we created for it. But the big takeaway of this editor is everything is visual. visual and everything is effectively drag and drop. You know, at a glance, I can move anything around, do, 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 do. If I double click it, I can actually edit it. Oops. So, you know, me as a, you know, as a content person, I didn't need a program to help me with this. I can go in here, you know, I can add, you know, I want to change its base price. You know, whatever. Uh, all of this is trivially easy to do. I can customize how it looks, how it behaves, what does it look like in the world, you know, configure its orientation in the world, things like that. All of that can be done. The, sa the settings are saved automatically to a remote server, so someone else who comes in sees it immediately. Very efficient. And that's what we're showing is that the, the efficiency gain pays off massively. On the surface, it seems like, well, it's a lot of work to create tools. And the answer is, it is a lot of work to create tools. But the savings are too big to be you know, ignored. And ultimately, we found that tools make or break a big project. That's really something you, I did not expect. This. I, as a developer, did not feel that tools would be that important. We actually got around this by writing Excel spreadsheet importers. I, I know, I'm ashamed. But it's a, it was pretty cool. It took a spreadsheet, and you'd fill it out, and then you'd, we'd actually had a tool you could upload the spreadsheet to in the browser that would load the database. So it's better than many projects I've been on. But ultimately, uh, even, even that was being replaced by tools helped immensely. Because now I can have, I, even QA people can go in and make a change. They're like, oh, that's obviously misspelled. They can just go fix it. You know, you, you really put the power back into the hands of the people who see the problem, can fix the problem, and I don't have to have my developers do it. Because developers, once again, are, are expensive and they're kind of grumbly when they're not doing coding things that they like. You know, they're, they're, let's be honest, we're pretty high maintenance. And uh, so if I can get them out of that, all the better. Oops. I'm trying to figure out. Uh, that's actually an error application. All the way back through. There we go. Don't save changes. 
Yeah, that's actually an error application. We can show, we, we actually have a whole pile of tools if people are curious, but we want to show that just to show that's a very simple example of a tool that massively sped up development just by orders of magnitude. Uh, it used to take, you know, a long time to build a map. Now it's down to a day, two days, three days. Depends on the complexity of the map. But uh, you literally just drag and drop items, position them, and, and you know, back to business people not knowing their requirements. The game designer's never going to get that map right. They'll be tweaking that map. You'll be launched. They'll still be tweaking the stupid map. It never ends. It's just expected to never end. And so speeding that up helps. This is another quick example of a tool that used to be very time consuming, um, sequencing animations. And so we built this little animation sequencer tool. Uh, we've got a lot of tools. But we've, over the years, we've built them as, we've, uh, as we found weaknesses that need to be addressed. And so for instance, this is another tool that significantly speeds up development. So the, the leaving tools behind, uh, this one is pretty quick. The, how do you, we're trying to ignore game design on this, so we're, we're, we're hitting the main concepts. One of the things we found was a weakness in many projects is a uh, ineffective design or a limited design of like the in-game economy and the flexibility behind it. Uh, and it, on the surface, you think, you know, economy is uh, very simple, right? They buy items. Maybe they can sell them back. And that's true. But when you start looking at how you're going to monetize your game, all of a sudden you have requirements like tiered access to items or content and much more sophisticated items, items that have a limited number of uses, things like that. These are critical to giving you the flexibility you need to design the game that will make you money. And so this is back to an architecture one. You need to architect your game to be very flexible up front to support this. And this is a key area we've seen has been weak in many games. Uh, and so they end up having huge efforts to add the functionality to get microtransactions in there, for instance. You know, to get support for micropayments and the like. So one of the big things is you need to have a very flexible inventory system under the covers to support any number of things. You just have to plan for the future, go nuts. It's one of those things you really should invest some money in to get it right. You need to support basic things like you know, inventory, scarcity of items, restocking, uh, multiple types of currency, things like that. You know, different vendors selling things for different prices. All of these things give your game designer the tools they need to come up with a much better game. If you don't have that, what will happen is the game designer is going to do another Me Too style project where you've got vendors that sell things that are all the same price. They always have an unlimited inventory, for instance, so there's no item scarcity, which means you, you immediately have a less interesting economy if everything's always available. Right? If there's no scarcity, you know, I wonder how popular the iPad would really be if it was uh, more available. Or the Wii. I mean, how much of their traffic was driven by the fact that it was hard to get? You know, there's very clear examples of this being important. You want to give that ability to your game designers. Uh, and, and then finally, you, know, you really do need to plan for that tiered access because, in fact, there's some sessions here. Uh, one of them is by uh, Turbine and DDO about how providing, uh, you know, going to microtransactions is you know, making DDO real popular and really helping them out. Well, that's uh, something we've seen everywhere. And micropayments depend a lot on items that are exclusively available based on uh, you know, account access or I paid for it or things like that. Well, you really need to support all of that up front and it, isn't, you know, it doesn't mean you have to build all that functionality in, but you need to support the infrastructure to support it. And that's, this is a, we've seen this as a key weakness uh, in many games, and it limits their ability to react to changing market. And so game design aside, supporting this makes you flexible. Not supporting this limits your flexibility. <clears throat> So in uh, <clears throat> all virtual worlds, browser-based or not, uh, avatars are, are central. Uh, everybody, everybody wants their own. You know, it's, it's a form of self-expression. And uh, in, in order to have like a, a really interesting avatar experience or, or personalization experience, you need, you need to make sure that they're highly customizable. So how do you achieve that? I mean, it's... It actually seems easy, and uh, I mean, as developers, you, you guys probably realize it's it's a little bit more difficult than it looks like. But if you go to Club Penguin or, or any other sort of uh, popular browser-based virtual world, it, it looks simple. You know, you you can just take some model and, and swap out stuff on it. But when you actually go to build something like this, um, and especially if you try to make something a little bit more interesting than a little egg, like a like a penguin something with moving parts and uh, um, more customization options, it's actually very difficult. Uh, I mean, there, there's things that you would never think of, like uh, uh, 
being able to create like a purse that kind of goes around your shoulder and then goes under the shirt part like the shirt has to go over and under like a strap and it's like how, how do you how do you deal with things like that how, how do you structure the avatar in the first place how do you create the assets so that um, one shirt would fit on multiple types of avatars um, and the the answer is there's there's a lot of ways to, to try to solve this problem um, it's it's something that we've We've tried, I don't know, I bet, I bet we've tried a dozen, a dozen ways over the years. And uh, I've, I've boiled them down here to uh, four really basic uh, techniques. And uh, so we're, we're just going to look at these briefly. Um, so the obvious first one, just to get it out of the way, is, is 3D rendered. Uh, if you're using Unity or, or some other uh, client that has built-in 3D support, it's, this is the obvious choice and it's, it's really it's the ultimate choice that you would want to be able to use even in flash if you could um, but the the reality is uh, in, in flash as, as Mike talked about early on uh, maybe you can get one or two avatars um, rendered 3d in flash uh, and I mean unless you're gonna have your unless your avatars are spheres <laughs> or boxes you know you, you're not gonna be able to support our rule of thumb is people want to be able to see 20 avatars on screen at, at a time. Your environment may have 100, but as you walk around, you want to see about as many as 20 on screen at once. And when, if you're going to try to render uh, straight from a 3D model, um, you, you can't achieve that in Flash today, as is our experience. Um, and so we, we just, we don't even try, at least right now, you know, in the future, we, we may give that a shot again. Um, there, there's another approach. Um, so it's 3D rendered. Uh, this is this is kind of popular in Flash. Uh, it's, it's not one of our favorites, but we've we've tried it. It's layered animation. And this would work in Silverlight as well. In fact, all of these apply directly to Silverlight. Too. Or or pretty much any. It would apply to any client that's able to uh, render sprite-based assets. Yeah. And uh, uh, and in fact, Unity is coming out with a, a sprite version of it, or some kind of right. Some. Yeah, a sprite engine. So um, in, in Flash, like you, you can create animation. So you can create like, let's say you wanted to have your avatar walking in eight different directions. So you could create like just this hair layer. Um, I know this is way too small to see, but that says female hair, <laughs> that top layer. And if I made the other layers invisible, you'd just see her hair, and you could see the hair dancing like it's on the Invisible Man. As it, as it walks along. And so you can load in these different animations, that are, they're pre-animated, and you just layer them on top of each other to achieve the customization. So if you want to customize your avatar, swap out the, the red hair for the blue hair, and it's customized. Now the, the, the downside of this approach, though, is that purse example has to swap layers based on the rotation of the character. And you think, okay, well, we can handle that. Well, what if I'm talking earrings now, and which are sometimes ahead, sometimes behind? You end up starting to have dropouts where it's not rendered for a few frames, it is rendered for a few frames. I mean, don't get me wrong, you can solve it, but it will take an eternity. And by the time you're done with a highly customizable avatar, the amount of code to support it is unmaintainable. And not, not to mention, this is this is all hand created, and and so, so it's. Mean, yeah, you could. This example here is hand created. <laughs> this is hand drawn and hand brought in Flash and everything, so it's it's time consuming. So uh, there's another there's another approach that you see. This I believe this is what Club Penguin is using. This is something that we've used a few times over the years. We don't use it anymore, um, and it's it's, it's a, something we call puppet style. It's it's really creating a movie clip ar architecture in Flash, where all the all the it's I guess it's like creating a skeleton. Or, um, and they're all pre-animated pieces, and it's basically an, an empty shell. And then you can load in pieces, like say this from your shoulder to your elbow, from the elbow to the wrist, whatever. Or, you know, a shirt would be divided into like five pieces. You load in all these different pieces, and you kind of slap them together, like it's a construction paper type of a thing. And and it just instead of having your assets animated, the the skeleton is animated, and the assets are just rotated along with it. Uh, this is extremely time-consuming to set up the uh, the structure of, of the of the movie clip, and requires somebody who's um, has a glutton who likes pain, you know, and uh, and someone who's who's really familiar with how to how to structure deep levels of movie clips within Flash. And it still has the rotation problem that 
things like that. Mm -hmm. the, the benefit of this is uh, you can have, uh, I mean, you, you, have, you animate the, the skeleton once, and then your shirt is just five pieces, and you don't have to have, have an animation of that shirt. So your, your items become very lightweight. It's, it's not quite the, the panacea, though, because there are many animations, for instance, that your shirt isn't going to handle. Like, an arm over the head means you're going to have to draw the bottom of the shirt for certain things where you might not to. You know, when you're just walking, you can get away with just rotating this little piece. But as I start doing more you know, extensive movements, rotation all over works. Right. So you end up having to do a lot more work to support that. Not to mention, if you, um, uh, three months down the road, you've, you've got 100 shirts, you decide to add a jumping animation that you didn't have yet. Now you have to go create new assets for that jumping animation for each shirt. So kind of a problem. Um, so let me check the time real quick. We just have a few minutes left here. Uh, so I'm, I'm going to start talking about a uh, sprite sheet approach now. This is, this is what we use uh, in almost everything these days. And uh, there's, there's a lot of ways to, to approach sprite sheets. But basically what a sprite sheet is, is is a huge image with a film strip of, I guess, keyframes of an animation. And uh, uh, the one on the left is uh, for MTV project we did. It's a guy running in four different directions. And if you, as you go horizontally, it's, it's each, each frame in that animation. So you can load in this one asset um, and then use very fast bitmap techniques in Flash to play the animation back. It's old school, baby. Yeah, it's old school, uh, but it works great. Um, there's ways to keep the, uh, the image footprint much smaller than you'd think, uh, like real small, like 15K for one of these sprite sheets. And uh, so it's, it's, it's pretty flexible. Um, I've got a couple more of these here. So uh, like with the layered animation approach, uh, you can do layering with sprite sheets. So you can, you can have like a naked dude. <laughs> Although we would say always have clothes on the base model. Oh, yeah. Because we, we, I don't even want to say how many naked avatars we've ended up with over the years. So many that we've made coffee mugs with different naked avatars. <laughs> so it's, it's, it's and it always happen. happens. It always happens. So there, there's, there's some glitch and now my avatar has no pants. And so you want to make sure you draw some underwear on, on the avatar. Um, all right, so uh, you, you can load in uh, layers of sprite sheets. So you have like your, your naked avatar, bottom layer, um, pants, shoes, uh, uh, top, I've got hair. You add all those together and it's, it equals that guy on the right. So that compositing can actually be done, well, I think it's the next slide. That compositing can actually be done on the server side mm -hmm. so instead of the client. If you do it on the client, you have to load all those different layers of sprite sheets, which is expensive. Uh, there's a lot of efficiencies in loading a single sprite sheet because when you compress an image it takes into account all colors in the image so if I load four sprite sheets that have lots of blank space you think that might be smaller due to the blank space compressing better but what we found is in practice compositing those first significantly reduces the file size then you use a trick like ping quantization and do an 8-bit ping with a uh, uh, you know with a rich alpha palette and we can go into this in the air booth if anyone's curious a trick like that and you can significantly reduce the file size that's how you get those 20k big sprite sheets yeah so so instead of like you can see here we have 64 naked ladies um and dresses and then hair and you can layer all those together and you achieve one sprite sheet yes you can load all three of those uh or four or five or six of those into the client and do the composite in the client or you can just tell the server to composite it for you. You choose which customization options you want, the server composites it, and you stream it back to the client. We typically do this via like a, uh, uh, a URL, uh, and we write either an Apache mod or some Java web app code that knows all the sprite sheets, and then it knows via the URL what clothing to wear at a single point. And you know, concern is always hacking in a case like that, but if I were to hack that, I'd only be hacking my own machine. So if I can run after I'm naked on my machine, that's not a security risk. And there's no way to hack other people's machines because the assets themselves define what they're wearing. So it's, this is actually a very effective technique that we've used in multiple projects. Works great. The asset pipeline can be 3D generated. So you can, you can actually draw your avatars in 3D and then render sprite sheets. There's some tricks to doing that. All the major 3D programs will support that. So, so that purse example we were given, uh, giving, you can, uh, you can solve that by using 3D models on the server. And uh, yeah, you, we won't get into too much detail on, on, on how we've achieved some of these things, but uh, you, you can have pretty much the ultimate level of customization by still using 3D models on the server 
and then at the click of a button, you customize, it kicks out the sprite sheets, load them into Flash. So you, you still get the benefit of 3D, but the benefit of having uh, the performance back in your app with using sprite sheets. So with that. Do you then patch the composite sprite sheets so that you don't have to redo it? Yes. Yes. We, we use uh, a front-end HTTP accelerator, basically, and uh, typically if we do the 3D rendering on the server or this rendering, what we do is you have a horizontally to the unlimited degree scalable solution, so each server is a rendering farm in its own right, and then we typically have a single mount point over the network for NS, NFS or something like that, uh, NAS, whatever happens to be your infrastructure. So you have all of your rendering servers to NAS, and then you have uh, front-end uh, caching servers that can store their cache on NAS as well. And then doing something like that gives you a really efficient approach. And then you just throw a load balance in front of the caching server. So you can literally scale this to hundreds of servers. Any good caching layer like Varnish or uh, Mod, uh, Proxy, any of those can do this pretty well. Um, there's a few tricks to it we can talk about in our videos if anyone's curious. But any of those techniques can cache this beautifully. And so you only render when needed, when it doesn't exist. So. With that, I, I think we're probably out of time, right? So um, feel free to ask us some questions. Um, uh. I had a real quick comment just to add. Uh, in one of the other slides, you talked about ways of um, uh, not getting the costs too high and that sort of stuff. And you mentioned that developers are generally very bad at estimating uh, time. Uh, one thing I've had a lot of success with in that area is if you require your developers to break their work down into very small tasks, they will not only, and developers actually estimate really, really well on like two hour to one day pieces. If you force them to break it down, they'll suddenly think of all the things they have to do that they'll just lump them together into that one week's worth of work that really is three weeks or five days, depending on some random thing. Like if you break down the pieces, they become much, much more accurate than estimating that time. Yeah, our, our experience has been the same. Um, we didn't touch on any project methodologies because that's kind of a, uh, uh, well, to be honest, it's a holy war. And if we propose one thing or the other, I'm sure one side or the other would lynch us for it. But in general, that is absolutely true. The smaller the task breakdown, the better it is. And that's ultimately the, the concept of agile, you know, is to break it down to a minimum degree and then do the burn down for the amount of time allotted. And I wasn't really professing agile necessarily like, like that in some cases. But just at some point, you're going to ask developers how long will it take to do this, whether you do waterfall or whatever. If you require them to document the pieces to, to do that, like just a list of things, that thought process needs to make it much better. Yeah, we, we would certainly agree. What's your typical ratio of the test to get out? How does that change depending on the different development platforms that you use? The ratio of what? Test. Test. Test to development. Oh, test or supply? Well, I don't know. Depends on the product, really. Complexity of the project and features really dictate that more than anything. Uh, to, typically, we uh, uh, we play it by ear per project. If, if the project has, if you've got great content tools and I can rip out consistent content, you're going to need a lot of testers because I'm going to have lots of content. If I've got a simpler project and the automated testing is covering a huge sweep of it, then I need less testers because there's less content that's unique. So it really is project centric, and we uh, we don't have any hard rule of thumb that I know of. Do we? Our CEO's back there. He keeps the numbers. <laughs> Uh, yeah, it's project centered. Yeah, I was going to say. How do you put it for the different platform? Unity, Next Flash, HTML5. Are those some that require more technical oh, testers? Oh, absolutely. HTML5, your testers all need to be masochists, as do your developers. <laughs> um, so, yeah, so different platforms are much harder. Uh, Flash actually is not too bad because it's pretty universal. If it's going to crash, it crashes pretty much everywhere. It's pretty good about that, you know, if it's, it's friendly. <laughs> um, Unity, I can't speak to specifically, but browser testing in general is, is agony. I think, think we got to go. We're getting kicked out. <laughs> Sorry, guys. We'll be around. We're not going anywhere. So if you have any questions, you can come up and ask, and we'll see if we can answer as best we can. Thank you. But thanks for coming. <laughs>